In this video, we're going to finish covering the major adaptations that occurred in plant history. So um, at this point, we're ready to talk about pollen grains and seeds. If you recall, when we left off, we talked about how ferns and moss both had a major restriction. They have to live in areas that have a lot of water directly on the ground in order to help transport their sperm from the sperm producing centers to the egg of another member of their species so that they can sexually reproduce. And so it would really be helpful for, for plants if they could find kind of a way to get around that restriction. And we're gonna see that pollen grains are really an adaptation that do that. Pollen grains contain sperm within them. Um, they're not directly sperm. They're actually a multicellular structure that just contains sperm inside. Um, but they're still lightweight enough to be able to travel through the air quite easily. And so that really is a mechanism for the sperm to travel through the air from member to member of the species. Um, if we think about um, typical plants that produce and release pollen, we, we know um, in the springtime that there are plants that release a lot of pollen um, in an attempt to just kind of hope that some of those pollen grains reach another member of their own species. And when that happens, the pollen grain lands just in the right place um, in the ovary that kind of contains the egg, and then the pollen grain will actually build a little tube all the way down to where the egg is, and then when the um, uh, tube reaches the egg, it releases the sperm to still swim, so the sperm actually does still swim to the egg, and when the sperm reaches the egg, fertilization happens, and so this is actually like a little pine cone that's been cut open, and I want you to imagine that maybe these represent like fertilized eggs, and then what happens is that a seed will form around the fertilized egg. So the seed is our second adaptation that we're going to talk about. The seed is really useful for kind of two purposes. Uh, number one, there's typically a very tough coat around the seed that just kind of protects the offspring from damage um, before it tries to develop into a member of its species. And the second really important purpose of a seed is that it contains a, a kind of a supply of food inside that allows the offspring to have this strategy called dormancy. If a seed is dormant, then it's sort of in a very inactive state. It's not trying to grow because what uh, plants can do is uh, they can't really, they can't move, right? So if they can't uh, uh, go somewhere else, if they've landed in a really bad place for growing in, uh, as a member of their own species, maybe what they can do is they can try to wait until conditions improve. Uh, for example, what if it's really dry in the area and they're, they want it to be a little bit more wet and so they can actually wait until it rains and then they can actively grow and try to become a, a member of that plant species. So um, this really gives uh, plants the ability to survive longer and, and gives um, their offspring a better chance to grow and survive. Okay, so let's talk about some species that have these new adaptations. We'll talk about the cone-bearing plants first. Um, for our purposes, you can kind of think pine trees or anything that makes a cone. Um, there are really two broad types of cones. This little part, if you look carefully, especially in the spring, um, these are sort of the pollen-producing centers, and that's why they turn really yellow in the spring, because they're starting to release them. Um, these are the kinds of uh, plants that release tons and tons and tons and tons of pollen in the spring, um, hoping that some of that pollen will eventually reach the female part and uh, fertilize the egg inside. And then this female whole cone here will drop. Um, and and that, this really is kind of the problem that cone bearing plants have. They can't send their offspring very far away from the parent plant. They can't get their offspring very far away on land. Um, and that's why you often see cone bearing plants kind of in dense clusters together where you see them because they really, with their cones just falling, they can't get their seeds very far. We're gonna see that the next group of plants have a much better strategy for actually sending their offspring far away to kind of colonize um, areas much more easily. And so let's go ahead and talk about those innovations. We're gonna see that those two innovations are flowers and fruits. Flowers really improve on the pollen strategy and fruits improve on the seed distribution strategy. So let's talk about those in turn. 
Flowers obviously contain pollen in them, and so what's really the purpose of flowers? Well, you know as well that flowers attract pollinators like bees and other insects typically, um, although sometimes birds and bats too. Um, but some kind of animal, because pollen um, can be carried by the animals from plant to plant of that species. And so the whole idea of flowers is that those um, plants can produce much less pollen because they can uh, simply uh, know that they can attract an animal pollinator to come take their pollen from organism to organism. They don't have to make so much and shoot it out into the wind and hope for the best. So just by making some nectar, um, plants can easily do that because they can do photosynthesis. And then typically with very attractive colors and scents, they can lure these pollinators that come and take their pollen to help them fertilize. And so flowers are a very successful strategy. As soon as pollen reaches another member of the species and fertilization occurs, um, part of the flower will turn into the fruit um, and also the seed will form around the fertilized egg. And so let's talk about what the fruit is doing around the seed as kind of a second adaptation. Fruits are um, really helpful for getting the seed far away. What I was talking about before with the cone bearing plants, the problem that they had. Um, one strategy for doing that is by making sugary fruits, kind of the fruit that we're most um, typically think of when we think of the word fruit in kind of common terms. Um, and so the idea is that often in nature, animals will eat the entire fruit, seed included, and then the seed is inside the animal who might walk away and eventually poop out the seed um, after it travels through the, the digestive system unharmed. Um, and then when, when, the, when the seed is pooped out, it's typically very far away from wherever it came from. And so that's one strategy for getting the offspring far away. Um, but as it turns out, there are other types of fruits as well. And sometimes it surprises students to learn that these are also considered fruits. Um, so if you've ever walked through a field before, if you've ever had your um, maybe a pet dog run through a grassy field and then all these burrs were kind of stuck to its fur, that would be those flowering plants attempting to get their offspring further away. So this is actually considered a fruit as well. It's just kind of a, a sticky barbed fruit, um, but it gets the offspring seeds very far away. Um, this is a helicopter fruit. Sometimes these are called helicopter seeds, but this is actually the seed right here. And then the rest of the structure travels really well through the wind. And so it's actually considered a helicopter fruit. So again, kind of actually, you're starting to see that the biological definition of fruit is a little bit different from our common usage of the word. Um, a fruit in biology is just any structure that develops around the seed to help get the offspring far away from the parent and to help spread that species somewhere else on land. And so with those two strategies, flowering plants really dominate today's um, world. Um, you can imagine that any obvious flower that you think of, like tulips, daisies, roses, are flowering plants, but so are big trees, like oak trees, for example, and so are almost all of the plants that make the food that we eat. So like raspberries and fruits like that, um, or cucumbers, or corn, um, all of those are plants, and, and really what we're eating are the fruits to help spread their seeds. And so with this ability to survive in places without direct water because of the uh, pollen, um, and their fruits that help distribute their seeds around, that's what makes this particular group of plants um, so dominant um, in plant history today. All right, so we kind of talked about uh, most of plant history, the transition out of water and onto land, and then we found um, additional adaptations that help plants live further and further on land, um, and finally, uh, adaptations that helped spread them really far so that they could colonize all over the place very easily.